Welcome, Ben Mama. I think anyone with an interest in retro gaming is more than aware of the Vectrix, an ultra cool all in one console and monitor that uses arcade like vector graphics for its display. Originally developed by a company called Smith Engineering back in 1982 and then subsequently licensed to General Consumer Electronics, GCE, who were actually taken over by the famous Milton Bradley Toy Company shortly afterwards. It was finally released in November 1982 at an eye-watering retail price for $199, which is over $500 adjusted for inflation. But as Milton Bradley took over international marketing, distribution and manufacturing, they were able to cut the price several times, but never quite enough to make the machine a success and cut it to the market share of industry leaders Atari. Like its rivals in the Atari 2600, Mattel Intellivision and ColecoVision, it was hit very hard by the video game crash of 1983, and by early 1984 sales were so bad, even after more price cuts that took it as low as $49, Milton Bradley made the decision to discontinue the console completely, and gave all rights back to original creator Smith Engineering. But enough about the history, let's get into the topic at hand, and hit you with 10 amazing facts about the MB Vectrex. This is an ordinary TV video game. This is Vectrex, the only video game system with its own video screen. Take it anywhere, just plug it in. It's your own personal arcade. A high performance system with a built-in game plus a whole collection of arcade cartridges like Scramble, Hole Position, Berserk. So if you're into video games, forget the TV. Get into Vectrex. Light pen and 3D imager available. Not many people are aware that back in the early 80s an alternative version of the Vectrex console was developed by Smith Engineering that closely resembled the look of a TV monitor. You know, like the ones you would find on a film set or a sports commentary table. Although the design was quite radically different, it still had all the same functions as the original console, albeit with a smaller screen. It's unknown why this smaller and more compact model was never produced and its exact origins, however you will be pleased to hear that a fully working prototype of the console was recently discovered and can now be found on display at the National Video Game Museum in Frisco, Texas. It's a shame this never made it out the door, as it sure would have offered a more portable version of the console that you could take on your travels. As already mentioned at the start of this video, the big point of difference the Vectrix had from other video game consoles, which connected to televisions and rendered raster graphics, was that it had an integrated vector monitor which displayed vectors instead. Whilst this display was monochrome, you could use clever plastic screen overlays to simulate colour as well as various static graphics and decorations, particularly in the borders. At this time, many of the most popular arcade games used vector graphics, and through a licensing deal with industry leader Cinematronics, GCE was able to produce high quality versions of famous arcade games such as Space War, Rip Off, and Armor Attack. GCE even adapted many other famous arcade games into vector form like Berserk, Scramble, and Pole Position, giving the system a huge point of difference from its many rivals. <laughs> In 1984, the Vectrix became the first home system to offer a 3D peripheral, called the Vectrix 3D Imager, predating the Master System 3D glasses by several years. Many describe this unique device as an early predecessor to VR. Whilst it didn't offer the body tracking or movement associated with virtual reality, the 3D Imager did put 3D graphics right in front of your eyes, immersing you into a whole new world of realism. He used a special gyroscopic colour wheel that had to be inserted into the unit to make this possible. But this came with a number of problems. Most notably it would stop moving if you turned your head, and it also caused some people to see double. But it did actually give a remarkably sharp and impressive three-dimensional image. The 3D image arrived on the market just a few months before the Vectrix was discontinued by Milton Bradley, meaning it was only produced in very small numbers, and is now very rare and collectible. Only three games were developed for use with the add-on, a 3D version of Mindstorm that came bundled with it, as well as 3D Narrow Escape and 3D Crazy Coaster. Although a number of other prototype games were developed, such as a 3D adaptation of Pole Position, and there have been several 3D homebrews produced in more recent years too. In 
One of the most fascinating facts about the Vectrix is that back in 1988, Smith Engineering began work on a handheld version of the console. And this is interesting for a number of different reasons. Firstly, because it confirms that development of the Vectrix technology actually continued under Smith Engineering long after the system was cancelled by Milton Bradley. And secondly, and perhaps most interestingly for Brits like me, the unit would have utilised Sir Clive Sinclair's flat screen TV technology that he had been proposing to use on a ZX Spectrum based laptop called the Pandora, which also never came to fruition. It is also worth noting that Smith Engineering's founder, Jay Smith, had already created the world's first true handheld console, the Microvision, for Milton Bradley back in 1979, so had quite a bit of experience in this sector already. It's rather unclear how far into development this portable vector has got, and no prototypes or even a concept drawing have ever been found. Many speculate that it probably would have looked something like the PC Engine LT, a small portable console rather than being a true handheld. All development of the miniature Vectrix was halted when Smith Engineering got wind of the Nintendo Game Boy and decided that their own handheld wouldn't be able to compete. Many people will be surprised to learn that the Vectrix saw a release in Japan in 1983. In this form it was known as the Kuso Kusen and featured very prominent Bandai branding on both the unit and the controller. Despite being accompanied by a pretty substantial advertising campaign, it failed to take off and disappeared from the market not long after. Probably the biggest reason for this lack of success was the fact that vector-based arcade games were never a big thing in the land of the rising sun, unlike elsewhere in the world. The main manufacturers of vector-based arcade games like Atari, Cinematronics, Vector Beam and XD were all American companies and rarely distributed their games in Japan. Japanese consumers are also well known for being incredibly patriotic and purchased items made in their own country as a preference. This is why we also saw systems like the Atari 2600, Commodore 64 and more recently the Xbox consoles fail to make an impact in the Japanese market. <laughs> One of the defining features of the Vectrix was its clever controllers, featuring a small joystick and four buttons that clipped into the base of the console to keep them safe and sound when not in use. As cool as this was, it wasn't the most unique feature, especially when you consider that the Mattel Intellivision, which was released several years previously, also featured controllers that fitted into the main unit. It was the aforementioned sticks. These small motor joysticks were actually analog, unlike the digital controllers of its main rivals like the Atari 2600 and ColecoVision, giving full 360 degree movement within the 3D environments the Vectrix offered. Somewhat similar in many regards to the analog thumbstick offered up by the Nintendo 64 some 14 years later in fact. So the next time you hear somebody mention the N64 joypad as some kind of amazing innovation, point them towards the Vectrix and then watch them weep. Another idea that was played around with at Smith Engineering, but never came to reality, was that of a Vectrix based computer. Of all the crazy ideas that Jay Smith came up with, this one has to be by far the strangest. It was the complete capitulation of their own home console market in the wake of the great North American video game crash and the rise of home computers in their absence, like the Commodore 64, Apple II, and Atari 800, that put the seed into his head. But it never got any further than the initial planning stages before he decided that it was a bad idea. I really can't see how a home computer based around vector technology could have worked, especially when it comes to things like basic programming and word processing, but it's a pretty cool piece of trivia nonetheless. Believe it or not, the Vectrix wasn't just used as a home console, there were also a limited amount of units that were adapted for other uses too. Firstly, we have the case of the Minicade, a Vectrix console that was fitted within a new enclosure with a coin slot and timer so it could be used as a bar top arcade machine. You got a set amount of playtime for your coin and could extend this by adding more money. If you think about it, this was almost the perfect way to get more exposure to the hardware. It just came a little too late. 
Secondly, and following the discontinuation of the Vectrix, MB sold much of the remaining stock to a medical supplies company to turn into heart monitors that would be used at places like shopping malls and restaurants. Now that really is thinking out of the box. By the time the Vectrix arrived on the market, Color Vector games had already debuted in the arcades, with the likes of Atari's Tempest and Gravatar devouring coins everywhere. So many wondered if the Vectrix would follow suit, and indeed Smith Engineering were already considering an upgraded console based on that technology. The plan was to create a new version of the hardware that could display games with up to four different on-screen colours, as well as black and white for backwards compatibility, and prototypes of this design were subsequently developed. Unfortunately, Smith Engineering ran into a number of problems with this project. Firstly, a colour vector display proved extremely costly to produce back in 1983. And secondly, it was also far more unreliable than the traditional monochrome vector displays. A prototype of the colour vectrix was unveiled by Jay Smith himself at the 1999 Classic Gaming Expo in Las Vegas, Nevada. Unfortunately, this prototype can only display games in two alternate colours, red and orange, rather than the proper multicolour display we were promised. It's a shame that this dream never quite became reality. Whilst light pens certainly weren't a new thing for computer owners, they were unheard of on home consoles. Until the Vectrix came along that is, because in 1983 GCE developed and released such a device for the console. This incredibly clever tool allowed you to draw straight onto the glowing monitor and create angular pictures. But it didn't end there, because budding artists weren't the only ones catered for, as alongside GCE's Art Master, there were two more cartridges in the form of Melody Master, an awesome tool for creating music, and Anim Action, that allowed you to create simple cartoons. The only problem with this was that there was no way to save your creations, or indeed print them off. There was also a fourth title plan too, in Mailplane, which can be picked up on cartridge in its prototype form. This would have catered for all the gamers, as you used the light pen to control all the on-screen action. Unfortunately, this amazingly innovative title went the same way as many other Vectrix projects, but it was cancelled due to the devastating North American video game crash at the end of 1983. GCE also planned to follow up on the light pen with the Vectrix keyboard, adding yet more computer-like functionality to the console. This is the system chosen 2 to 1 over Atari and Intellivision for real arcade gameplay. Fantastic! Presenting the revolutionary Vectrex arcade system. Ordinary home video games can't match the laser-sharp visual effects of Vectrex because only Vectrex has a real arcade screen built in. No TV set needed, so every Vectrex cartridge gives you real arcade gameplay that others can't. Vectrex, it stands alone. And that rounds up my look at 10 amazing facts about the MV Vectrex. How many of these fascinating facts did you know? And are there any cool facts about the Vectrix that you're aware of that I left out? I'd love to hear the views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section and let me know your own thoughts and knowledge. But before I go, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. Giving special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Mitchell Valentino, James Taylor, Neptune, Chaotic, Seth Robinson, Carl Olson, Dos Gamer Man, Tiago Piero dos Santos Silva and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to a host of extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.